All right. Can you uh, can you hear me today? Yes, I sure can. All right. Very cool. Very cool. All right. Well, um, so so tell me uh, tell me a little bit about who you are and uh, and what you do. Yeah, absolutely. Well, if I could uh, sum up my life in a little verse that I wrote years ago, kind of in a nutshell, I once was but a lump of coal upon a heap of mire, yet Jesus Christ redeemed my soul and saved me from the fire. So that tells you a little bit about <laughs> who I was and what God did in my yeah. life. But uh, my name is uh, Emil Zwayne. I go by the initials EZ, and I'm honored to serve as the president of Living Waters, which is a ministry that was founded uh, and is currently led by our CEO, Ray Comfort. And I get the privilege of serving here under Ray's leadership and leading our ministry forward and fulfilling our vision, which is to inspire and equip Christians in fulfilling the Great Commission. And uh, along with that, I am uh, a blessed husband of uh, one wife and five children. Uh, so yeah, you don't want to mix those numbers up. Don't want to mix those up, exactly. We want to make sure uh, we're, we're on the right side of Scripture with that. So, yeah, right. that's uh, that's in a nutshell who I am. Very, very cool. Well, you're, um, as you know, uh, you know this, uh, your ministry has been, um, has had a tremendous impact on, on, on me. I mean, the, the Lord definitely used uh, what you guys do to, uh, for me to hear the gospel after a sort of period of, of uh, me starting to question whether or not uh, Christianity is true and then, and then attending church for about a year but not really uh, being saved. And then uh, then it was hearing the gospel uh, through one of your videos, one of your ministry's videos, that uh, that really led to um, what I consider my of, uh, of, re- of rebirth. Um, certainly was um, the major, major changing or major, major turning point for my life. So mm. I appreciate that and thank you for that. Oh, it's a pleasure, and that that to us is the heartbeat behind what we, you know, why we do what we do. It's testimonies like that, uh, and people saying, "Look, I was impacted, touched, changed." Uh, we get testimonies of people who say, "I thought I was a believer, and then I listened to one of your sermons, or watched one of your movies, or one of your television programs, or what have you," and suddenly I recognized, "Wow, you know, I I, I didn't know the Lord, and I came to saving knowledge of Christ," and so. It's a delight, and thank you for sharing that, Skip. Praise God for what he's done in your life and how he's used Living Waters. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, um, you guys got have a lot of things going on right now. You just had um, another movie come out uh, last Friday, right? That's right. It's our movie, Seven Reasons. Sort of a follow-up to our previous movie, 180, on the whole abortion issue. And it was such a delight to see what God did with 180, uh, you know, it was something that actually came together unintentionally. Uh, Ray was uh, doing a, a video to kind of go along with a book he had written called Hitler, God, and the Bible. And so he thought he'd go around and interview people about the Holocaust. And in the process of doing so, as he was hearing about how people were so horrified by it, he thought he'd insert a question uh, in connection with it about abortion. And so that led to one interview after the other, in that vein, and suddenly we looked at it and said, I don't think we have a, a movie about the Holocaust. We really have a movie about abortion. And so we put it together, released it, and we're absolutely blown away by the response. Uh, to date, it has uh, over 5.6 million views on YouTube. We've uh, distributed and sold over 1.2 million DVDs, and it has been aired all around the world on the television. And we are just amazed by the fact that we've gotten numerous pictures sent to our ministry from mothers whose babies were saved by God's grace uh, through watching 180. And so, you know, we're in a place in our country now where the whole issue of abortion has kind of gone on steroids with the whole uh, late-term abortion fiasco that's gone on in a few of the states right. and it's spreading through the nation. So we thought we'd do a follow-up movie to it, and I think people are going to be just as uh, encouraged and impacted by Seven Reasons they, as uh, they were by 180. Yeah, you know, I had a, um, I have a good, a, a good friend who had been a friend of mine, um, and, and went to, I went to church with him and, and, and everything. And uh, anyway, we were talking about politics one day. This was two years ago or so, and uh, and he, the issue of abortion came up, and he goes, oh, I don't really have an opinion on that. 
And uh, <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> and so I was surprised to hear that, you know, and so uh, I actually referred 180 to him. And now, of course, he's uh, realized that that's definitely something we can't take the middle road on. Yeah, exactly. You know, I think a lot of times people just buy into the deceptive rhetoric that's going on today in our nation about a woman's choice and a woman's body. And it's a mantra that's played over and over and over again. And then it's parroted and mimicked by others. And they don't pause long enough to really think about what they're really saying. And so the amazing thing is in the movie, like with 180, Ray Comfort really probes that with people and and puts certain questions to them that make them think. And at the end of the day, you see people changing their minds on the spot. And you could tell it's it's not just some kind of whimsical thing, but you could tell it's like, wow, that it really made them think and they saw it in a light that they never saw it in before. And so the movie is meant, of course, for unbelievers to watch and for babies to be saved, but it also encourages believers and shows them in, in a very realistic way because it's Ray really talking to real people how to engage people on the subject. And, of course, the real uh, purpose behind it all is, is not only to save babies but also to give people the gospel. Right, right. And that's one thing I really appreciate about the Living Waters Ministry, too, is that even if you have a secondary goal in a, you know, like 180 or, or like seven reasons where you, you know, your goal is on one level about abortion and abortion awareness, you include the gospel in that as well. Um, which is, which is of course ultimately our, our the primary focus of everything, right? Right. Absolutely. And that's it. It's, uh, it's the heart behind everything that we do as a ministry. And it's, uh, part of our calling as Christians. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 tells us that our calling as God's people is to be ambassadors for Christ. God wants to plead through us to the world to be reconciled to Him, and uh, we have a ministry of reconciliation. God reconciled us to Himself, and now He calls us to be those who go out and proclaim to others uh, the ministry that we were reconciled to God through, uh, because we've partaken of it ourselves. So that's it. That's why we do it, and uh, we do it for the glory of God. And so we, so we're you know, as you as you know, we've talked about we're in the middle of what we call uh, Mission Upstate, where we're trying to get the gospel out to all one million people here in the uh, in the Upstate of South Carolina, and um, really using local churches to do that. And in, in partnership, one of the things we made sure to do is always include the and you know from scripture, but it's also from um, pointed out to me. You know, I don't know that I necessarily would have arrived at that without the help of your ministry. But what is the importance of putting the law in gospel encounters and, and working that in as always a part of a witness encounter? Sure. You know, I think a lot of times when people hear the law mentioned, they immediately get this uh, misconception that we're talking about coming under the Mosaic law as a, a, a means for salvation for us as Christians or that we were meant to live under the law as though we, we were bound by it. But an understanding of it biblically is that, you know, the law or the, the Ten Commandments, the moral law of God, um, the Decalogue as it's referred to uh, theologically, uh, was given to us by God as a schoolmaster, like Galatians 3.24 talks about, that it would lead us to Christ that through the proclamation of the law, what happens is it's held up to people like a mirror and it reflects back to them what's true about their nature. And so, as it says in 1 John 3, 4, sin is transgression of the law. That's the definition of sin. It's the violation of the moral law of God. And Romans 7, 7 makes it really clear. Paul says, I would not have known sin, but by the law. And so... And, you know, people don't understand that, that there's a lawful use of the law. In First Timothy 1, 8 through 11, uh, Paul says, look, but we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and, and, and subordinate for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers, and if there is any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. That, that is the purpose of the law. It's, it's a schoolmaster. It reveals to people their sinfulness 
And once that happens, then it causes them to flee from their sin to the foot of the blood-stained cross in order to receive redemption and salvation. Uh, the law doesn't make us just, but it, it leaves us guilty before a holy God so that we can run to Christ to receive his righteousness and his His grace through which uh, we're saved. Amen. Amen. That's, yeah, I mean, um, spot on. And, and when you look at witness encounters in the Bible, whether it's Acts 17 or whether it's the woman at the well, you see the use of the law or the specific conviction, whether it's a specific sin or a sin in general, in every single one of those. Um, right. Yeah, um, and but, I think oftentimes people by default, go toward a life enhancement message instead of preaching that, as it tells us in Acts, God now commands all men everywhere to repent. Instead of preaching that people are to repent because they've violated the law of a holy God, we basically use a life enhancement approach and uh, basically tell people to come to God so that they can feel happy and get peace and that all their problems can go away uh, versus people understanding that uh yeah, there's coming a day in which God is going to judge the world in righteousness, that people are to flee from the wrath to come, that we've offended a holy God. And when when you try to tell people they need to get right with God or Christ died for their sins, but you don't take the time to explain to them how they sinned against God, then it can almost be an insult or an offense to them. But if you take the time to open up the moral law of God, not, not just in its uh, objective application, but even as it relates to their internal sin, the, the the spirit of the law, showing people that Jesus equated lust with adultery, that he equated uh, unjust hatred uh, in the heart with murder, uh, unjust anger and hatred in the heart with murder, that, that uh, if you use God's name in vain, you're guilty of, of uh, blasphemy against against the holy God, and, and so on and so forth. You, you take them through the, the letter and the spirit of the law to show them they're offenders, and once they recognize the severity of their sin, then you lift up the cross. And oh, how the grace of God is made all the more glorious when people recognize, wow, I'm that much of a wretched sinner, I'm that much of an offender against such a holy God, and yet he came and gave his life on the cross for sinners. Wow. He died and rose again to set his enemies free. As scripture tells us, God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so once once the laws opened up, people recognize how guilty they are. Then the cross makes sense and they they are blown away by the love, mercy, and grace of God. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's so true. I know, for, you know, for me, I could have, I could have, conv- I mean, growing up in the Bible Belt, I could have told you at pretty much any point in my life, you know, that Jesus died for our sins. I right. had no idea really what it meant beyond that, or what that had to do with me. Um, I remember actually being a kid in, um, in a church one time, one of the handful of times I'd been taken to a church. Um, it was a sleepover, and we all had to go to the church. <laughs> Everyone of the sleepover had to go to the church. And so, um, and, but I remember thinking, like, man, they must, uh, I'm not entirely sure what, what's going on, but they must not like this Jesus person because they're all celebrating death. Um, you know, he had no concept of, uh, of what that really means. Um, and right. even when I was older and I got a little bit of a better concept, you just, it doesn't make sense until you recognize your own depravity. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. And so we need to be faithful witnesses uh, for Christ and, and and do that. And again, I, I love what Ray said when he got a hold of the importance of the use of the law. He said, it's like God took from him the feather duster of modern day evangelism and he gave him 10 great canons. And that's such a powerful way to put it because I remember before I, I understood this biblical principle, I would try to share the gospel with a, a an old lady and I'm trying to tell her that she needs to have this hole in her heart filled and Jesus will give her a better life. And, and she's looking at me like, man, I'm 90. What are you talking about? You know, <laughs> I don't, I'm good. I, I, but I, but you know, I remember sharing the gospel with a, a 90 plus year old neighbor of mine and she trembled under the law of God because no one is exempt from that. You have people who, you know, feel great. They, they, their finances are in order. They have good things going on in their life. They, 
they don't feel that sense of emptiness per se. I'm not saying that there isn't the void of of the of the life of God within a person, but sometimes they're they're not even in tune with that, you know, with that reality. But in any case, no one is exempt from being a sinner and an offender of, law, of God's law. And so when you put that to them, then they recognize, wow, okay, well, here's why you need to be saved. Here's why you need Christ. Sin is serious, and, and, and it incurs the wrath and judgment of God. But look at his love. Look at his mercy. Look at what he did for undeserving sinners. And then it makes sense. And most importantly, it's glorifying to God, and, and that's the biblical model that we see. Exactly. Well, and when you take that approach in, in a loving and, and caring way, um, you can do even things like crazy street preaching, and uh, and it can be very effective, right? Um, right. And uh, you know, you're not a crazy person yelling on the corner. Instead, you're somebody who cares and is compassionate. And it, exactly. Um, Amen. Tell, tell me, uh, tell me a little bit about your your background. I we, I know uh, I I know a little bit of the story, or. Um, but were were you always a uh, a crazy street preaching person? <laughs> I was I was always it seems a crazy street person. <laughs> I was a, I was a gang member before I came to Christ uh, when I was a teenager in high school and had a pretty pretty crazy past. I grew up in a Catholic home uh, and was born in Lebanon, that small country in the Middle East that borders Israel to the north. And came to the U.S. with my family. I was about four and a half years old and grew up in a war-torn country, so I had a little chip on my shoulder. So from the time we arrived here, I, I was quite the troublemaker, you know, trying to cope with being in a new country, a new language, a new culture, new people all around me. And so right off the bat, even in kindergarten, I started uh, making trouble. And by the time I had turned 16, I had already been... Or before I turned 16, I'd already been kicked out of two high schools. I had become a gang member with the Crips, and I'd attempted to commit suicide in front of my own family. But on a divine August evening back in 1991, God reached down His hand in the time and space and grabbed the hold of the heart of this wretched sinner, opened my eyes to the truth of the gospel, and radically, radically transformed my life. And so I was, uh, again, just a, a month shy of 16, but God uh, grabbed a hold of me and absolutely transformed my life. Everything about me, the way I walked and and talked and thought and acted and felt and, and spoke, everything uh, just completely revolutionized. And I uh, ended up graduating high school, got back into the, my original high school where I got expelled my freshman year. I was actually my class president when I got expelled. And got back in there uh, and went from a 0 0.32 grade point average at the end of my sophomore year to a 4.0 my first semester back and wow. began uh, leading Bible study on campus, sharing the gospel, and went from there to a Christian university and biblical studies and theology major. Became a part of a Bible study that uh, grew to over 200 people. Ended up, uh, we became a church that I, I co-planted uh, and pastored for about six years and then came on full-time here with Living Waters about 16 years ago, and it's just been an absolute delight to see what the Lord has done. There are days where I step back and I just shake my head and say, Lord, I, I just, I, I'm blown away that I get to do this, and that in light of who I was and where I was, you allow me to, to participate in a ministry like this, and so it's a, it's a real joy and delight, and I'm still not used to it in terms of... Uh, being an enamored by God's kindness. Praise the Lord! Yeah, no, that's uh, that's that's amazing. Um, absolutely amazing. Um, very good. Well, what um, what advice would you have for someone? Um, say someone's listening right now. They feel the need to evangelize. They've heard me talk about it. They've heard you talk about it. Um, but they're just not sure really where to start or what to do. Um, other than just go do it, which I think is probably pretty sound advice. Um, sure. what, what, yeah. Um, what would you say? Well, the first thing I would say is the gospel is not that complicated. And uh, we're given the gospel in First Corinthians chapter 15. It's the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. And, you know, we proclaim that message with truth and clarity. Um, it wasn't something that was... Uh, a figment of man's imagination. We know when, when Christ did that, as it tells us in 1 Corinthians 
15, he did it in fulfillment of prophecy, hundreds of prophecies in relation to who he was. And we see that when he rose from the dead, he appeared to, to many witnesses. And so we know that the gospel is, is simple and a person who becomes a partaker of the gospel is both qualified and, and technically able to communicate it and proclaim it. In fact, sometimes the most passionate of evangelists are those that are new believers because just like the leper in Mark chapter 1, they've experienced the, that transformation. And if you remember in that chapter, the, the leper was warned by Jesus not to say anything to anyone. And it says he went out and he began, began to proclaim it freely so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the cities and they came to him from every direction. And so you think about it, this leper single-handedly made Jesus famous, even after being told by Jesus not to say anything. And that I've always found that comical in a way. It's like a leper, right? It's a death sentence. You're basically imprisoned in, in your own body. You're, you're a, a walking corpse so to speak, your flesh is rotting, your, your, some of your, uh, your limbs are beginning to fall off, you're isolated from your family, your friends, you're ostracized in a colony, basically waiting to die a slow, miserable death. And Jesus touches this man and in a split second completely transforms him. I mean, a whole new lease on life, skin as, as smooth as a baby's. He just got his whole life back. And then he tells him, but don't say anything to anyone about what I just did to you. <laughs> and it's like, uh, okay, but look what he did. Now you think about it. There are a lot of parallels between us and this leper. Because uh, like him, we we ha have had a terrible disease. Like him, we were touched and healed by Jesus. And like him, we were given a command. That's where the differences stop quantitatively, but qualitatively, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, that's where the similarities are, rather uh, qualitatively, but quantitatively, uh, the, the, the differences are so huge because even though we had a disease, our disease is far worse than the one that he had. And even though we were touched and healed, our healing was far greater than his because ours has eternal consequences. And even right. though we received a command, his was a negative, don't go, ours was a positive go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So if we had a if we had a worse disease, if we had a greater healing, and if we have an affirmative and more important command, then how much more famous should we make Jesus? Just on the basis of that. I once was blind and now I see. Here's who I was. I was lost. I was dead. I was blind. Jesus touched me, healed me, saved me, and you can be saved if you repent and believe, place your faith in him. Uh, it's awesome. And again, like I said, 2 Corinthians 5 makes it clear that we're, we're ambassadors for Christ. We're just as much ambassadors for Christ as we are human beings. If we were born to a human father and mother, we are human. If, if we've been born again, we are ambassadors. And so the question oftentimes isn't whether or not we are ambassadors for Christ, because if we are born again, then we are. The question is, right. is what kind of ambassadors are we? So my encouragement to people is, look, Throw your whole heart into who God has called you to be on this earth. Fulfill your calling. And so we do that in life. I remember years ago, I had a friend say to me, we used to uh, work together, and he said to me one day, Easy, how do you share the gospel with people? Memorize scripture, know uh, facts about the Christian faith. And this guy was amazing in the workplace. He knew the, the, the price of every item. He knew the history of every product. He was great with customers. So I remember I wrote him a letter, and I said, My dear brother, What's the difference between memorizing $3.16 and memorizing John 3.16? What's the difference between memorizing facts about Christianity and memorizing facts about products? What's the difference between walking up to customers boldly and representing the store's policy and coming up to, to unbelievers and re boldly representing the gospel? Of course, there's the element of spiritual warfare involved. We have an enemy that doesn't want the gospel to go forth. But I think more than anything, it's where we invest our heart, our time, our energy, our passion. We grow and excel in the things that we want to grow and excel in. 
And so I think that a big part of it is people need to invest, study, read. We have so much at our fingertips today. At the click of a button, we have access to basically all the knowledge in the world. And so there's so many great resources, so many great ministries that can help you. Ours is a ministry that exists for that purpose. And so I'd encourage people to go to livingwaters.com and make use of our resources, our YouTube channel, our Living Waters YouTube channel. You go on YouTube and put in Living Waters channel. And, uh, you know, we have... Three, over 325,000 subscribers and uh, 70, almost 72 million views. And there's videos that show you how we go out on the streets and actually interact with people. So I'd encourage people to make use of all that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and, and you're so right. You know, it, it was easy. You know, as a young believer, I went through a period where I couldn't help but evangelize. And now I have to, it's, it's sort of almost sad in a way because now I have to sort of probe myself and make myself, um, you know, at times. And then I have, you know, better days. But, right. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, as a, as when I was a young Christian, it was, you couldn't stop me. Um, I was telling everyone. I was the annoying family member at the Christmas party that no one wanted to eat with, right? Uh, right. The, uh, <laughs> and so. And so yes, it's uh, and so yes, it's it's amazing. And now it's now it's an intentional thing um, that I have to think about a little bit, but still. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's it's understanding the grace of God that uh, you know he he's working in us both to will and to do for His good pleasure, and we're going to grow in that. It's a part of our sanctification. You know, I, uh, Ray Comfort, myself, uh, some of the the greatest evangelists that have ever lived uh, have struggled with fear and nervousness and anxiety but i love what has often been said and ray echoes it quite a bit and that's that fear or uh, courage is not the absence of fear it's the conquering of it it's mm-hmm. acknowledging yes i'm afraid but hey what is the worst that'll happen to me if if i go out and share the gospel with that person well they might reject me they might say some things that are hurtful uh, here in america we don't typically get beat up for sharing the gospel but what's their worst fate well, it's an eternity in hell, and we right. have the everlasting gospel. Where where is our compassion and our love uh, in light of the grace we've received from the Lord? So yeah, uh, I love a saying I heard years ago. It says, "When desperation exceeds our fears, progress begins." And so we need to be desperate to see souls saved, and then we'll advance. Amen. Exactly, and that's definitely that's definitely a motivation to have. Like when you. Um, you know, when I've seen someone or, you know, when I've been engaging with someone, once the first words leave my mouth, sort of all fear goes away. And now you're just thinking about, okay, here's a here's a person. Here's a lost person who I love and I care about. Right. You know, it, it, that to, for me at least, the fear sort of melts away after those first couple of words. <laughs> you know, once yeah. you start, once you approach the person, then sort of everything melts away and then now it's just a, a human being, an eternal being, who's either going to glorify God through an eternity of wrath or glorify God through an eternity of mercy. And, um, right. Sort of that in mind. Yeah, exactly. Well, um, well, thank you very much. Um, thank you for, very much for uh, for your words as well uh, today and for being on uh, with the podcast today. And then also thank you just for your work and for your ministry in general. Absolutely, brother. It's a pleasure, and thank you for what you're doing for the kingdom. Press on, and I encourage everyone to remember that evangelism is an act of worship. It's something that we do in response to an amazingly gracious and merciful God who has saved us. And we we do it uh, out of love and gratitude. And I love, again, what Ray Comfort always says, what I can't express to God in words, I express in works. And we have to remember, we're saved by grace through faith, that not of ourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. But verse 10 of Ephesians 2, uh, following those two verses, 8 and 9, says, We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And then in 2 Timothy 2, we're told that we can be... Uh, prepared for every good work, a vessel of honor, uh, useful for the master, prepared for every good work. So every good work is prepared for us. We're prepared for every good work. And then we walk through life in this act of worship. And what happens is what I call a divine convergence. God allows our preparedness and the preparedness of the 
evangelistic encounters he has divinely orchestrated to come into convergence with one another at a certain point in time and space and God does amazing things and, and it's just wonderful. So that's my encouragement and thanks again, brother, for having me on. Thank you. Thank you. Come in and thanks again, brother, for having me on. Thank you. Thank you. Come in and thanks again, brother, for having me on.